Hi, this is Mike Edelhart, and I'm here with another edition of Inception, our podcast about beginnings, the beginnings of companies, new science, new uh, ideas, and sometimes even a little glimpse of the future. And we may be talking about all of that uh, here today with Paul uh, Chen of uh, Flourish, one of our newest, newest companies. You still have new investment smell on you. We just uh, funded you literally uh, days ago. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here, Mike. Now, this is a podcast, so it may seem sort of normal, but even if it wasn't a podcast, it would be a podcast because we're doing everything over Zoom. <laughs> um, and, uh, and everybody's feeling isolated and uh, all kinds of reports out about stress and mental challenges and mood problems and you name it. And uh, in a very uh, fundamental way, you and your company are here to help people quite directly deal with that. So why don't you explain what you're doing and, and why of all the things you might have chosen to do, you decided to do this and now. Yeah, absolutely. So what we do at Flores Talk is to train people to become more empathic. Empathy is the foundation of meaningful relationships and great relationships are the foundation for people's mental fitness and wellness. We're launching an app uh, actually the day after uh, tomorrow, so early November, uh, to do this in a scalable way. Really, we wanted to build an app that helps me foremost and, and people like me. Eight years ago, um, my mom and I had a huge conflict uh, over, over my girlfriend. Um, I became pretty depressed and uh, in fact, uh, even had suicidal thoughts. Uh, back then now thankfully and you know i'm okay now um and that's due to the fact that one of my friends uh, from stanford medical school dr david carrion uh, who is a co-founder of, of flourish uh, was studying psychiatry uh, at stanford and he helped me process through my mental health crisis now kind of reflecting back on my own experience what made me realize is that you know good relationships really require skills because it's it's no doubt that my mom and i loved each other as mother and son but you know, our way of communication really did not lead to the loving response that we anticipated. Uh, instead, we just corner each other more. Um, and you know, I was blessed to have a friend like Dr. Karen from Stanford Medical School, uh, you know, to talk, to walk through my own valley of darkness. But millions of Americans today are suffering mental health issues caused by bad relationships. I know for a fact that not every one of them has a friend from Stanford. So that's how David and I got together and really felt called to start a company that uses this technology to scale evidence-based skills and practices uh, that improves people's mental and emotional wellness. That's the beginning of the story. So you're talking to, that's great and great story. And uh, uh, I suppose before, uh, I come back to, uh, I should note, me too. I think maybe one of the things we can do here is just acknowledge everybody goes through the valley of darkness at some point. No one should shy away from this. Uh, nobody's immune, uh, et cetera. Uh, anybody out there who's feeling darkness should recognize that. Hell, call us, call whomever. But coming back to the company, why is training empathetic people the way to do this. Why wouldn't you be saying now, Mike, we found a better way to route people to the therapist. Mike, we found a better way to use, I don't know, biomarkers to recognize uh, uh, that folks are uh, feeling uh, somehow dangerous. Why is it all about empathetic people? Traditionally in Western medicine, the way to think about mental health or emotional health is usually focusing on the, pa uh, the client or the patient individual, him or herself. Um, probably has something to do with our Western kind of, you know, individualistic ethos. Yet, what's peculiar or what's unique about mental and emotional wellness is that, uh, well, I cannot have emotional health with bad relationships. Um, so, like, mental health is fundamentally a social phenomenon. That is to say, I must have flourishing relationships if I want to have any hope of uh, having, uh, you know, good mental health. In fact, uh, almost 20 years ago, a group of researchers from the University of Michigan have done a study that indicates that having bad relationships is just as likely as having a heart attack to cause you to feel depressed. So this is being proven by really smart people in the world that relationships really matter 
to your mental health. And as I pointed, as I mentioned earlier, uh, empathy is a key pillar to flourishing relationships. Now we can dig into why that's the case, but I, I want to pause here. So um, is the goal here for uh, the Flourish platform to help me help myself? Is the goal here to help me help myself by helping others? Is the goal here to um, uh, begin to uh, find out from a group of sort of random folks that some folks are really good at helping others and then creating a community that in it has structure for helping folks or all of the above or what? <laughs> or just what are the interactions that matter? <laughs> uh yeah, all of the above. Uh, you know, it's going to be iterative. When I feel supported by the intimate relationships around me, whether it's my wife, my mother, my friends, I will be more mentally stable. I will be mentally healthier. As a result, I will be a better husband, a better father, a better son, a better coworker to those around me. Therefore, causing less stress to those around me and as a result, contributing hopefully to a positive mental impact on those around me. And so it's iterative like that. So you're focusing on sort of the individual in society or the individual yeah. in the group or in the bosom of uh, 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 love. And, and we've talked about this. And some of the folks who listen to this podcast have heard me say, we at the fund uh, are big on love. Uh, and we're big on love because it correlates that a, a small group of humans who love what they're about and love one another can essentially accomplish anything, but also a small group of humans who love each other and love what they're doing are essentially in a family. They're, 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 the mutuality creates the environment where you can just sort of relax and uh, allow yourself to be whoever you are and allow the others to be who they are, and that then tends to accentuate the positive in uh, in a rather fundamental way mm -hmm. uh, so that's one reason why when we heard what you were doing it resonated for us let's flip it over to the business side so imagine yeah. someone of an entrepreneurial frame of mind is listening to us talk and goes sure. well that sounds terrific but why is that a business and and i can see this going on in church basements and i can see it being very <laughs> helpful but how is this a business so you're talking about big businesses how does this become a big business Absolutely. So the analogy. So I'm going to ask you two questions, Mike. Um, do people in the United States take physical health seriously? <laughs> well, I have I have kinfolk in Alabama. So not everybody in the <laughs> well, United States. A substantial uh, number. But of uh, you know, and one of the things we're seeing. I mean, to be serious, one of the things we're seeing from COVID is that folks, as a whole, are becoming much more conscious of their own physical well-being. Uh, they're caring more about what they eat. They're actually exercising more uh, because this isolation has driven a certain introspection and given people back some uh, control over their time, whether they wanted it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you will probably agree that physical health is a pretty big deal that people take seriously today, right? Sure. Generally. Now, the second question is, do you also agree that valuable businesses I kind of alluded to this. Valuable businesses have been created to support this growth in people's interests in physical health. Sure. Yeah. So companies like so I feel like I'm on the stand here. Yes, Perry Mason. I, I have, I'm compelled to agree with you on this point. <laughs> so 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 yeah, companies like SoulCycle, Peloton um, have become huge businesses because they tap into this insight that hey, you know, people really take physical health seriously. So we're gonna become a great company to fulfill that need. Now, same thing. As I mentioned, I believe and our team believe that mental and emotional wellness will be just as important, will be accepted as mainstream as physical health has been accepted today. Maybe not right away, maybe not in a year, but in a few years, yes. So that creates an opportunity for companies to become that infrastructure company to support the growth in emotional and mental well-being so that's why we have we have a business and, and the way we and we know people are willing to pay for it i mean you probably have a friend who is willing to pay 300 bucks per hour to see a therapist now that's a great quite a few quite a few friends quite uh, a few yeah. and and you know I, I paid money to to see a marriage 
therapist uh, a few months back, and uh, that was like a couple hundred bucks. So people's willingness to pay is there. How do we use technology to, to, to create a scalable solution? That's what we're trying to do. So just where's the business mm -hmm. right now? So um, uh, can folks listening to this go join up? Can folks listening to this ask to participate in the beta? Uh, is this something where you're talking about launching in a couple of days? So what does launch mean? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, folks are maybe hearing this a few weeks down the road. What is uh, their opportunity alongside you? Absolutely. So we believe in monthly subscription business. Uh, we think that you know the gym concept is a good analogy. So in two days, you can sign up to be a member, a beta member of, of Flores Tech, and you will get you have access to a number of videos. Each of them is two to three minutes. So you can watch it anywhere you want, and these are all videos that are produced by expert clinicians that are trained at Stanford and Harvard. Um, so you're going to watch these videos about empathy training. So you'll, you'll learn. And then you will be matched with another peer who shares your learning goals on empathy to do one-on-one -on -one peer coaching, basically role play practice, 30 minute session over Zoom. So two pieces you get. Got it. Really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing, um, what happens? You can certainly imagine that this could work. You could also imagine that folks would be Americans, in particular, kind of self-conscious. Here's a stranger, untuck. Uh, will folks really share in that way, that uh, degree uh, over the net with a stranger? And and how do you facilitate that? How do you make it yeah. sure it's possible that that's going to happen? Yeah. So, Mike, I'm glad you pointed out kind of uh, how stigmatized mental health and mental wellness still is. The way we hope to normalize the conversation is, so these are role plays. Like we're not asking you to share your personal issues. In fact, we don't want you to share your personal issues um, over uh, on our platform. You are here to practice certain skills. How you do it, so let's say you and I are doing role play. I'm the one who wants to practice my empathy skills. I've watched the videos. I want to put them into practice. You will start up the conversation by giving, giving me a prompt that simulates a real life situation. For example, Paul, you're such a pig. Why didn't you watch the dishes tonight? Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's a very familiar uh, thing that I hear uh, at home. And, and, and uh, you know, if we kind of tap into our natural man response, uh, I probably would not have responded very well. But our course teaches you to respond in a way that's respectful, but also communicates, you know, my own feelings of hurt or rejection uh, in a way that makes the other person and, you know, feel connected. So that's that's what we're doing, and we take turns. Got it. Very interesting. So then, flipping it over, how's the business? How are you? So <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this is all about empathy, and uh, 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 starting a company can be hard on uh, individual life, hard on relationships. You got uh, a young child, so um, you got both sides going at once, uh, in a way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it. I could not imagine doing anything else. You know, startup is not for everybody. You know, I think it was uh, either Mark Andreessen or Bernd Holowitz who made the comparison with startups, doing a startup that it, it's like punching a glass and, uh, and making it shatter and then bleed. And then over time, you start to like the taste of your own blood. Uh, it made no sense to me uh, back then, but it starts to make a lot of sense. That being the case, even as hard as it is, uh, yeah, I could not imagine doing anything else. You know, uh, it's going to sound pretty cliche, but life is short. And I think in 2020, that reminds people of our own mortality. And um, if I get to wake up every day having a chance to innovate and make other people's lives better, that's, that, that's what it's about. Yep. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, we say uh, entrepreneurism is a socially acceptable form of mania. <laughs> uh, same sort of thing. Why would you willingly hit your head against the wall year upon year upon year? Uh, and it's because, well, at some point the wall will fall down and I'll be responsible for it. And everybody can see something they never saw before, but that's not a normal way of viewing outcomes. Normal person would say, you're hitting your head against the wall repeatedly. That doesn't seem like much fun. So if we had your wife on here right now, what would she say about this? Would she say, this is great. I never see the guy and, uh, you know, he never takes out the garbage. Uh, did she know she was, you know, marrying into a circus family? 
<laughs> when she got here, or was this kind of a revelation for her? Yeah, so uh, thankfully, my uh, my wife uh, is smarter than me. So she went to Harvard undergrad, and she's in crypto. She actually works at one of the world's top uh, crypto companies, and she's one of the uh, marketing executives there. So she's in the game, and she understands it. Uh, so she and I, you know, we, we just, uh, you know, work it out every day, you know, kind of compromise on who is, you know, playing with the kid and who is doing work and all that. I mean, yeah. honestly, Mike, a lot of the uh, kind of uh, skills of managing homes translate very well to how to manage teams in a professional setting. My family has introduced constraints to my professional work. Now, I used to be frustrated with these constraints. Now I've come to embrace them as positives. Why? Because I think as a product guy or product woman, subtraction is way more important than addition. And having constraints actually forces me to really ask myself a tough question. What is that one thing that really matters? And, and I think having having a family or, or intimate, you know, domestic partnership um, forces me to uh, to detach, uh, and that's a good thing uh, for the business. Because sometimes when we are so entrenched with uh, what's in front of us, uh, we miss the obvious solution. But if we can just take a step back for three seconds, you know, yeah, I, I could. You know, I got a bunch of kids, and they're all grown now. But uh, when I started in sort of big shot jobs way back when. Uh, not many people around me had kids, and I would get some of the eye rolls like, what are you doing, man? Uh, you know, it's your career. But that's what I found, uh, that uh, my little babies, when I went home, they didn't care if I was hanging out with Rupert Murdoch or with the, you know, the cat on the corner. <laughs> they had a whole different set of needs and a whole different set of expectations from me, and it was clarifying, and it was a release, all this politics. And what it helped me realize is, it matters, but it doesn't actually matter. <laughs> um, this matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, Mike, what, what you're tapping into is kind of playing the long game. You know, yeah, I can probably, you know, work 24-7 for a couple of years and now we're hitting myself uh, and, you know, burn out. And a lot of people, I mean, this happens a lot in Silicon Valley. You know, they, they, uh -huh. they will go full speed for a couple of years and they will start to hate the very thing they love and how tragic that is, you know, I'm, I, I'm committed to do this for 30 years. So if I, if that's my time horizon, you know, that, that affects how I pace myself today. Right. right. So I guess the semi joke has to be 30 years only, huh? You're right. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> 30 years is what I, you know, that's my event horizon. Now you're going to be at this for 60 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably as good a place to leave it as any. Uh, this is turning into sort of the Egan Act uh, early show. Uh, <laughs> wonderful company. We think you're a terrific guy. Uh, courageous to be taking this on. It turns out, I think, to be, uh, I'm not sure if it's an ideal time, but very appropriate time to be going after this set of challenges. So uh, we're uh, uh, proud and uh, grateful to have a chance to be alongside you on this. And, we just can't wait to see what happens next. And again, anyone listening to this or looking in, uh, go look, don't hesitate, go look, there's help. And this is the one of places you may be able to, uh, to find it. Mm -hmm. Great Thank stuff. You, Thank you. Thank you.